Well, thank you so much. Um, it is really an honor to be here to talk about um, coral reef ecosystems, which are undoubtedly my favorite place to be anywhere on the planet, partially because of their spectacular beauty, which you can see, and also because of their spectacular diversity. Um, it's well known that coral reefs are thought to harbor at least one third of all of the species found in the oceans, although I'm sure that's arguable. But actually, our hostess of the evening has just published a paper showing that even that diversity is underestimated. And so um, the stories and that these ecosystems have to tell us are numerous. These ecosystems are also incredibly important. Um, they, of course, provide a, a food source for much of the world. They, um, are, they offer protection for shorelines. They, um, have ec they generate economic revenues in terms of um, tourism and uh, other sort of fishing pursuits and many other reasons. But these diverse and important and beautiful ecosystems um, are, are really, as I said, a, it's a very exciting time to be studying them as a coral reef scientist. I would have to say it's both exciting and scary. It's exciting because this field, about five decades young, has finally laid the foundation to understand um, and to begin to unravel some of the complexity of these reefs and really get at some fine, really fine-tuned interactions, which are very, very exciting. But also scary because this is an ecosystem in trouble. Um, the statistics are sobering. Uh, no matter where you look in the world these days, as you look in more recent times, there's been a, a noted decline in percent live coral cover. Um, and some estimates are as high as 80% of loss in the Caribbean and up to 50% in the Pacific. And now we live in a time where we're near a threshold or a tipping point where many reefs um, face the possibility of not being coral dominated anymore, where they may be dominated by other things, such as macroalgae or sponges, which begs the question, would they still be coral reefs? And so what, are, what is a coral reef um, if it doesn't have coral? Corals are animals that build hard calcareous skeletons um, that are basically, the, build these underwater cities that are, is what hosts, this is what hosts the diversity of so many other organisms that live here. Um, and uh, these living cities are uh, full of all of this topographic complexity. You can think of these as apartment buildings with lots of, lots of animals living in the nooks and crannies. And if you lose this complexity, you will lose a lot of the diversity that we have on coral reefs. But before you write this off as just another talk that's depressing about the demise of coral reefs, let me tell you three happy things. First, I am honored and proud to say that many of the photographs in this talk are mine, unless otherwise noted, and they were all taken within the past year or so. Proof that I offer to you that with my own eyes, I have seen beautiful, thriving, gorgeous reefs teeming with life very, very recently, which I view as beacons of, of, of hope for what, they, what, what reefs may become and return to. Second, I'm going to end this talk with a project um, that Nancy mentioned about the Phoenix Islands, which I believe is one of the most exciting projects in the oceans today. And before we get there, I'm going to talk to you about five cutting edge topics, nice format, and uh, critical questions in coral reef science that I think um, deserve some attention. And I think all five of these topics really have a lot to tell us about how coral reefs live rather than just how they die. So to kick that off, uh, let's start with the most fundamental and most important topic um, on reefs. As, just as reefs don't exist without corals, corals don't exist without their photosynthetic algal symbionts. These symbionts are what um, help corals to derive most of their energy. Um, they are, they're small, they're about 10 microns, they're in the genus Symbiodinium. We've known about them for quite some time, but um, the field of symbiosis has been struggling to sort of put together a taxonomic and systematic framework to understand uh, this critical symbiosis. But it is important um, and very clear to see. There's, here are two colonies of coral. They're the same species. They live side by side in the reef. They're slightly different colors. Uh, the color difference that you see actually is because these two harbor two different types of symbionts. And um, this is actually very important. It may seem like a subtle point, but if they have two different types of symbionts, and when you hear about coral bleaching, it's, they're talking about the decoupling of, these, of the symbiosis. If, it, if corals are going to bleach, are they both going to bleach at the same rate? Are they going to bleach at the same time? Are the corals going to behave the same way? Is the symbiosis going to break down at the same level? Where you draw those lines also depends on how you characterize these symbionts, how you name them, how you organize them, how related they are to each other. And until now, I would argue that the field has been um, sort of working towards putting together this framework. A paper that just came out about three weeks ago offers some promising tools into, that may yield some insights into the systematics and taxonomy of this important symbiosis, which is fundamental for the life of coral reefs. 
Speaking of symbionts, it doesn't just, um, coral reefs have many, many symbionts, not just uh, symbiodinium, and we have an increasing awareness of some of the prokaryotes or the bacteria that live on coral reefs, which have been, are beneficial, not just coral diseases. And um, in order to figure out not only who these bacteria are, but what they do, coral reef science is beginning to invoke the use of tools which you know, we uh, casually refer to as omics. And by omics, I mean um, proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, for example. Um, and these sorts of tools are exciting, not just in understanding the prokaryotic communities, the bacterial communities, but they're also being applied to a suite of organisms all throughout reefs and being used as reef diagnostics. The idea being that these omics tools may be able to um, sort of be indicators of reef health, tell us what is happening um, at a genetic level before we see massive stress phenotypes or before we see mortality. So if these can serve as early indicators, that would be a very useful tool and it would be very helpful in, in coral reef science in understanding how even the same coral species um, are responding to stress differently from place one and place two or in time one to time two. So what kind of stressors are we talking about? These days, one of the major and most cutting edge um, stressors that uh, is sort of uh, attracting attention of the coral reef community is ocean acidification. As increased atmospheric carbon is absorbed by the oceans, um, the ocean pH is decreasing, which acid acidifies the seawater. Since corals are calcifying organisms, um, this obviously has a major impact on them. Um, in fact, um, this is known as the other CO2 problem. And as you can see right here, um, it looks like most corals are subject to the effects of ocean acidification in some way, shape, or form. Unfortunately, uh, the first CO2 problem is still a problem. It looks like uh, warming and acidification work synergistically. But a review recently came out and that asked the, actually in science, that asked, um, you know, is ocean acidification the end of the story for coral reefs? And what they showed is that basically um, it looks like these, uh, these global influences of both warming and acidification are more secondary agents of mortality. The primary agents of mortality are more local impacts, things like pollution or disease or sedimentation. And while we can't ignore these global things, and they certainly don't bode well for food chains and lots of other parts of the ocean, um, the fact that, there are, that local stressors are more immediately uh, threatening it means that we, they're easier to tackle. It's more, easy to, it's more simple um, to tackle a local problem than it is a global one. And so by tackling some of these local issues, we may be able to buy ourselves the time that we need to think about these more global issues. So how do we do that? How do we buy ourselves that time? The fourth topic I'd like to bring up is that of marine protected areas, which is really an, a topic that lies at the intersection between research and conservation. Marine protected areas are a tool probably the best that we have out there for trying to um, sort of stop everything that's happening at a local level in order to um, preserve ecosystems in general and reefs in particular. There have been several studies out there that have shown that a well-enforced, well-patrolled marine protected area um, is a highly effective tool, not just for the protected area itself, but for the boundaries surrounding it. There have also been um, studies that have said marine protected areas are really falling short of what we had hoped that they would be. Controversial though, though the marine protected area debate may be, let me say that the enforcement and the time scales and the spatial scales at which you look at marine protected areas is going to be the key to understanding whether or not they can work. And it is the single best tool that we have for looking at a number of problems in an aggregate. So how do you draw the lines? How do we make marine protected areas? The fifth area I'd like to bring up is one of connectivity. Um, if you think of reefs not as a single unit, but as a network of, of spaces, then you realize that um, we need to think about how, to, how connected they are. If you have a single reef that falters, can it be replenished from a neighboring reef? Um, there is a new study that is coming out next month that actually looks to see whether or not um, how, so it looks to see how connected these networks of reefs are. They actually study two species of fish and actually tag every single fish on the reef, adult, and every single new recruit in order to figure out where, how far these apples fall from the tree. And if they don't fall too far, then they really can't be used to reseed the next orchard over. 
and maybe they can. So these kinds of questions of connectivity are critical and cutting edge. And um, although we can tag some fish in the ocean, many sharks, for example, as you've just heard, um, tagging anything with a larval phase is um, arguably more difficult. And so these sorts of tools and studies are really, I think, the cutting edge of where we are in understanding um, where these lines can be drawn and how connected these areas are, not just for fish, but for invertebrates and every species in the reef. So these five topics are really important in coral reef science. As I said, I think they represent the cutting edge of some of the things that we're beginning to think of as a field. The problem is, is that we're studying them in systems that are already so degraded that any answer we come up with is hard to put into a real context. And so we have to go to places that are pretty far away in order to look at systems which are as intact as possible. Um, I'd like to now talk about a project, the Phoenix Islands Project, which I have an, it's an honor to work on in collaboration with a number of people, including Greg Stone, who I believe is right here. Actually, there he is. Hi, Greg. Um, <laughs> in our audience. Um, and he actually is, the, is sort of the founder of this project. Um, the Phoenix Islands are a really special place, uh, both for their remoteness and um, for what they offer science. When Greg first uh, discovered the Phoenix Islands, um, scientifically, they were pretty intact. They represented sort of what would be a primal ocean, and uh, I'll sort of show you where we've come since then, but first let me explain a little bit about them. The Phoenix Islands are in the middle of nowhere. They are <laughs> literally in the central Pacific, um, pretty much, I say, X marks the spot where the uh, international date line meets the uh, equator, and um, they are owned by the Republic of Kiribati, which is a country that actually owns three archipelagos in the central Pacific. The Phoenix Islands themselves are eight islands. They're mostly uninhabited, and they're pretty far away from everything. These two dots represent Hawaii and Fiji, and it's a five and a half day boat trip to the Phoenix Islands from either place. Um, that's about a thousand miles away. And their remoteness is what makes them so appealing to us as scientists now. Just to give you a sense of scale, these are the same three dots superimposed over the United States. So the Phoenix Islands protected area, um, until recently, was the largest protected area in the world. Now it's the second largest. And it is now, currently, remains the uh, largest and deepest marine uh, world heritage site. And it is represented by this um, box right here in the Central Pacific. And even though the box looks tiny in the context of the whole Pacific, make no mistake, that box is the size of California, okay, just to give you a sense of scale. And um, I should mention that this reserve was really created by the vision of um, Greg Stone, who, who is at the time was at the New England Aquarium, now with Conservation International. And this reserve was built as a, in a unique partnership with the Republic of Kiribati, the New England Aquarium, and Conservation International to get where it is today. And where it is today is, as I said, the world's largest and deepest world heritage site. It has an innovative conservation strategy. And it's the first Pacific Island marine protected area to have not only coral reef habitat, but deep sea habitat. Um, as connected reef systems, submerged reef systems, coastal open ocean, we've really um, taken a look at the area holistically, everything in that box and deep within that box. Um, unfortunately for the Phoenix Islands, uh, they also sit at the center of El Nino Southern Oscillation events. We call this climate change ground zero, which gives them um, an unfortunate penchant for um, getting very hot. So they are prone to massive thermal events. But as a scientist, this makes them extremely interesting. In fact, recently we think the Phoenix Islands suffered what is, we think, the, um, the most extreme bleaching event ever recorded in human history in 2002, 2003. So here's the Phoenix Islands. Here's our little box. This is Australia, the United States. This is a heat map of the Pacific. And the reddest dots in the center um, are at 35 degrees C, which is a known threshold for bleaching. And this is July 2002, August, September, October, November, December, January, seven months at extremely high temperatures. And of course, there was mass mortality following. This mortality, sad as it is, is a really great opportunity to look at a few things. Reef recovery and resilience, and the mechanisms by which reefs can recover if it, they do. And I'm happy to report that they do. So um, there are very few places in the world that you can look and see recovery and resilience when it's just a single isolated factor. Most of the time, it's reefs bleach, and they're also suffering from pollution and from disease and from overfishing. And, you know, name your stressors. So this was just bleaching. And of course, live coral cover declined um, following this massive thermal event. But in 2009, when we went back, they were almost 50% recovered to where they were prior to the bleaching event. This is remarkably fast for a, a slow-growing coral reef ecosystem. 
and it has a lot to tell us. So the reefs went from being completely dead to literally rising from the ashes, like the phoenixes that they are. And so what are the mechanisms by which this may occur? Um, we have a couple of guesses. Um, first, there are baby corals everywhere. Aren't they cute? Here they are. Lots of little baby corals. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of recruitment on this reef. So even though a lot of things died, there's a lot of new life springing up. Second, they're nestled in this blanket of pink, which is crustos coral and algae. Think of it as reef cement, and baby corals need it. They love to grow on it. And um, the Phoenix Islands was covered in a vast array of pink, which doesn't happen everywhere. Now, the Phoenix Islands, the reason we think it happened is because the fish community didn't immediately disappear when the corals did. The structure of the corals remained. No major hurricane knocked them over. They, they, they were ghost town, standing intact. And even in 2009, after all of this death and destruction, the Phoenix Islands, here we go, here's this comparative fish biomass across a number of reef systems, rank second, only, second only to the line islands. I mean, Fiji, for example, a mecca for diving and ocean havens, you know, way down on the list. So uh, the Phoenix Islands having this intact fish population, including herbivores, these fishes were able to keep the reef clean, eat the same things that they've always been eating, which created an opportunity for reefs to come back and resettle. I'll, I'll just say a couple of other quick things mechanistically. The, these are all pictures from 2009. The corals that resettled the area were fast growing. And they created, they were placeholders. And um, amidst these fast growing corals, which were able to completely preserve the space available for corals, we were able to see slow growing recruits, which means eventually we should see successional dynamics and a return to the community that we um, saw before bleaching. And of particular interest to me, I study fish coral interactions. These are pictures of corals that have been bitten by fishes, lots of fish bites. Um, uh, you know, I look at this interaction all over the world, and uh, we found six new interactions in the Phoenix Islands. Not because they don't happen other places, but in the Phoenix Islands, the fish still exist and the coral still exist. So just by looking at a place where the system is still relatively intact, we can make new, new discoveries, which are likely indicative of things that are happening everywhere. So to conclude, I just want to say that the Phoenix Islands are an opportunity to look not only at these types of dynamics, not only in the coral reef systems, but again in the deep sea, the open ocean, and in the terrestrial um, aspects of these islands. In the absence of local human stressors, they give us the opportunity to isolate global versus local effects. And in context of the whole central Pacific, the Gilberts, which are highly inhabited, and the lines, which are, have a gradient of human habitation, um, and the Phoenix Islands are the ones that really sit at the center of these ENSO events, these El Nino events, um, we can uh, decouple the influence of global versus human impacts. Important for those five topics that I brought up earlier, where we can finally look at these in an ecosystem that isn't already completely degraded by so many things happening at once. So the last question I'll ask, the cutting edge question of the night, what is the future of coral reefs? Wow, I wish I could answer that. <laughs> but what I can say is that um, corals are amazing ecosystems for so many reasons. And without corals, they look completely different and a lot less complex. I can't imagine a world without corals. And I think that all this cutting edge research that is going on in the field um, is, hoping, is lending some really great insights into hopefully keeping things towards the top of the slide. So thank you very much. Thank you.